Hey, Steve here from Grimwood Hollow. As some of you may know, I did special effects for movies for over 20 years, and I think my favorite movie I ever worked on was Men in Black. We created all of the hero guns, weapons, and gadgets for the film. Yep, we even made the flashy things. Throughout the 90s, I was the lead sculptor and prop fabricator at my buddy Rick's prop shop, RCP. We worked on a ton of movies, but for me, none ended up being quite as exciting as Men in Black. We had no idea at the time that our crazy creations would play such an important role in the film and be so prominently displayed. They were definitely some of the most rewarding props I ever worked on. Interesting job you guys have. And they were everywhere. The movie was a huge hit and our props were used in almost all of the advertising, marketing, and merchandise for the film. You really couldn't go anywhere without seeing our guns. But as much as you did see of our guns, there was one really cool secret that was almost entirely cut from the film. The secret alien brains. So in this video, I'm going to briefly walk you through each prop we made, give you a general idea of how we created them, and share my personal never before seen production photos. Then we're going to jump right into a tutorial of how we created the secret alien brains. All right, first up is the Neuralizer. This is called a Neuralizer. It's a gift from some friends from out of town. These were really cool, but really difficult to make. We started with these amazing production designs drawn by Tim Flattery. These were the days before CNC machines, so almost all of the parts we hand machined out of aluminum. The main shaft was just an aluminum pipe, and I remember having to machine every one of those grooves in it all the way around, and they didn't always work out perfectly. The top piece we molded and cast in urethane, then sent to a foundry to be cast out of metal. The neuralizer was spring-loaded, and this little clip was the button to open it. If you pressed it here, it would release it here, and the inner core would shoot out. This core had all of the working controls. The dials were acid etched out of brass and had LED lights behind them to illuminate the date. Days, months, years. It was really difficult to package all these electronics, have it spring loaded and still be durable. These were tricky little props and I think we had to make six of them. We had an actual strobe bulb in the head you would rotate this ribbed aluminum piece to the back, revealing the red strobe window, and then it was ready to flash your memories away. The neuralizers were really cool, and definitely one of the most iconic and remembered props in the entire film. Would you stop that? A standard issue neuralizer. Next up, the deatomizer. Series 4 deatomizer. That's what I'm talking about. Or what we nicknamed the Star Wars gun, because we thought it looked like a stormtrooper gun. Once again, we started with an amazing production design. For all of the large guns, we did a one-to-one -one scale foam core cutout that we used to build from. Other than a few off-the-shelf knobs, tubes, and detail pieces, we hand machined all of these parts out of aluminum and acrylic. After we machined and bondo sculpted the mainframe of the gun, we made molds and cast them out of urethane with a metal finish, which I'll explain in more detail later in this video. The fore end was cast out of urethane and actually slid on the track so you could pump it just like a shotgun. And if I remember right, pulling the trigger lit up all the custom LED lights in the tubes and vents. I think we ended up making four of these guns, but you really barely see them in the movie. In fact, they show them off way better in the trailer.
And now for my absolute favorite prop we made. Okay. Give the kid a weapon. Noisy crickets. I feel like I'm gonna break this damn thing. Yep, I think by far these were the coolest designs in the entire film. Dang, I wish I had one. I really had a blast working on these little guys. We hand machined all the parts, which we molded and cast in urethane, and then sent to a foundry to be cast in metal. Then we would clean and assemble everything. We ended up making six of these guns. When you cock the hammer back on these, it would turn on the glowing LED lights in the vents. The needle tips of the gun I made out of three telescoping brass tubes and then soldered and sanded the taper in between. And that's why they are a little wonky. <laughs> the grips I actually sculpted out of Bondo by making a silicone texture stamp off a gun grip, pressing the diamond texture into the Bondo, then molding and casting them in urethane. Sometimes when we finish a movie, we have a lot of extra parts left over. Either they had air bubbles or were just bad pulls or just extras that we didn't even use. On Men in Black, we actually did have quite a few extra random parts from the different guns and props. And it was always my intention to make myself a noisy cricket. But unfortunately, I never did. But luckily for me, they did make some really cool toys. This was my buddy Rich who we brought in to help us out on the project. And this is the only photo of me with the noisy cricket. These tiny but powerful guns made for some of the funniest scenes in the movie. Some other props we made were these flamethrowers, backpacks, and extinguishers for the cleanup crew. But unfortunately, I only have these two really bad photos. These were the days before digital cameras. Sometimes your photos turned out great, and sometimes they didn't. There were also a handful of background weapons we made for Jeeb's shop. These were mostly kitbashed out of found parts. Next up is the standard issue. So again, we started with the production design and hand machined most of the parts out of aluminum. I believe we made six of these. This was another gun where we molded the frame, poured them up out of urethane, and then sent them to a foundry to cast in metal. Then we'd get all the parts back, clean them up, and assemble them. The barrel was actually a neat design and they never showed what it does in the film. But it rotates and snaps into different positions for different sized barrels and blasts. Alright, now for a funny story. See these little spike details? Well I'm guessing Rick must have been inspired or subliminally influenced by my 80's punk rock bracelet I wore every day. Cause next thing you know, he started putting these little punk spikes on everything. They were on both sides of the J2, on the deatomizer, on the tri-barrel, and finally, we had to put a stop to it. We called them Rick's Tchotchkes. The J2 standard issues were a lot of fun to make, and they really did get some great screen time. All right, now let's get to the three main attractions. First up, the reverberating carbonizer. You sold a reverberating carbonizer with mutate capacity to an unlicensed cephalopoid. Jeeves, you piece of... It looked all right to me. The reverberating carbonizer probably had the most unique looking design of all the guns we created. And if you notice, 
This is one of the guns with the secret alien brain tanks. The idea was that these guns were created with alien technology and that these little alien creatures were controlling and creating the energy that powered these weapons. These were actually some of the easier guns we made and we ended up making three of them. We put these together like an assembly line using parts that were water jet cut, hand machined, and off the shelf parts. The alien tank was a custom hand blown glass bulb that was super fragile and really scary to work with and the alien design changed from a blob-like brain to a squid-like creature, which I will be doing a tutorial on at the end of this video. We filled the alien tank with either blue or green tinted water mixed with caro syrup to make it a little thicker consistency. This gun also had some lights. You can see one in the end of that radar dish piece. I feel like this is the most alien looking gun of all the ones we created and I'm glad I got some great photos of it. Look at these cool alien symbols that we even had water jet cut into the arm piece. One of these awesome guns ended up in the Museum of Pop Culture in Seattle, Washington, which is pretty rad because if you blinked, you might have missed it in the movie. Time to bring out the big guns. You know how to use these things? No idea whatsoever. The Pulsar Blaster. We nicknamed this one the train gun because it looked like a futuristic locomotive. All right, now I'm going to break down the process a little more of how these guns were created. We started with our cutout of the production design and jumped right into machining the parts. The main frame was milled out of acrylic and we hand sculpted the organic shapes out of Bondo. There were also a lot of aluminum planton pieces we machined and some parts were molded and cast out of resin like the nose cone. Once the sculpture of the frame was done, we created two piece molds out of a flexible but rigid urethane rubber. Once the molds were done, we used a metal coating spray unit similar to this that used a spool of zinc wire that pneumatically feeds into the machine where it heats up and atomizes the metal so it can be sprayed out of a gun similar to this. So then we would spray a layer of actual metal into our molds and back it with a urethane resin. The result was a lightweight plastic gun with an actual metal finish that could be drilled, tapped, and polished. And they looked amazing! We only had a handful of urethane parts that were chrome plated like the nose cone, and you can clearly see the flatter finish of the zinc metal on the body of the gun. Speaking of chrome parts, I thought I'd share my favorite story. One day, Rick showed up with a big old box of parts we had chromed. He was super excited about them. What I didn't know is that a whole bunch of the production team were showing up soon for a meeting. A while later, I stopped working to join them for this meeting, and I came around the corner, and... Well, this happened. <laughs> yep. I had hidden a cut off foot in the box of parts to mess with Rick, not knowing of course they were about to review them in this production meeting. Let's just say it made for a very awkward but hilarious moment that we'll never forget. The alien tank was really hard to see on the pulsar blaster. It was an acrylic tube on top of the gun. This tank had a green liquid with a little alien creature and it could just barely be seen in a couple shots like this one. We also had to make stunt versions of these larger guns, so we clayed up all the holes, made quick silicone molds, and cast them out of fiberglass and polyfoam. This one was made for Rick Baker to use with his animatronic roach that unfortunately was cut from the film. And then a couple other stunt guns were used when Edgar swallows the guns and explodes into slime. And finally, the Tri-Barrel Plasma Gun. This was another amazing gun design, and it had the most complicated of all the alien brain tanks because they wanted the water to bubble and have moving tentacles. The main frame of this gun was created with the same process as the Pulsar Blaster. It was machined, sculpted, molded, sprayed metal, and cast urethane. The barrels were all hand machined aluminum with some water jet parts. The grip, foreign and butt were all cast urethane parts and of course some off the shelf parts too. 
For the alien tanks, we hand sculpted, molded, and cast resin vacuform bucks of the tank, then we vacuformed a clear plastic front and back piece. These are some of the resin vacuform bucks, and these are some of the front and back vacuform poles. We then sealed up the alien creature inside the tank and attached a tube that we used to fill the tank with either yellow, green, or blue liquid. We ended up hiding an aquarium bubbler in the tank that we could attach an airline to. Then we could blast some bubbles in the tank that would make the little tentacles wiggle around and animate the alien. It was so cool. They actually filmed a number of close-up scenes with our bubbling alien tanks and even explained their purpose, but these scenes were unfortunately cut out of the final film. Here's Rich showing off the finished tri-barrel. I think we ended up making three of each of the big guns. And here's the man himself, my old buddy Rick, getting ready to take down some aliens. The tri-barrel and pulsar blaster were also designed so that the special effects team could hook up these umbilical cords with an actual pyroblast for that final showdown with the Edgar bug. These big bad guns were definitely impressive and there's no doubt why they became some of the most iconic props from the film. And now let's get to the fun stuff. It's time to show you exactly how we created the alien brain squid creatures. So all you need for this project is liquid latex, some disposable chip brushes, and a piece of acrylic, glass, or mirror. You start by brushing some latex onto the acrylic and making rectangle patches. They definitely don't have to be perfect. These will become the tentacles. Go ahead and make about 8 to 10 of these patches, and they can be different sizes. Next you're going to need to make about 25 to 30 of these small patches of latex using the tip of your brush. These will become the suction cups. The latex will start off more of a white color like in these thick areas and will turn more of a yellowish tan when it is dry like this. And you could always put it in the sun to speed it up. Once it's dry, you start by rolling back the corner of the dry latex patch with your fingers like this. Just keep rolling it up. Fresh dried latex sticks really good to itself. That is why you have to baby powder latex masks when you demold them. You don't have to be careful at all, just quickly roll up the entire patch of latex. And ta-da! You have your first tentacle! When I'm rolling them up, I often pull sections of the latex up like this and then smash it down and roll it into it because it creates really cool organic textures. This is a very old special effects technique used for many gags in the film industry. It can be used for tentacles and tendrils on a creature, for creepy vines, for gore and tendons on a bloody body part, and even creepy webbing. Just use your imagination. If you want a tentacle to be thicker, just take one you already made and roll it into another dry patch of latex. You can do this as many times as you want until you get the desired thickness and length. Now you should have a much thicker tentacle. I would do at least a couple large ones like this and four or five skinny ones. All right, next go to one of those small patches of latex and roll that up the same way, creating a tiny little tentacle. Then take that small tentacle and wrap it into a circle, overlapping the ends and pressing them together till it sticks and creates a ring. Congratulations, you have just made your first suction cup. Now make about 25 to 30 of them in different sizes from small to large like this. 
And again, they don't have to be perfect. Sometimes it looks more organic and creepy if it isn't perfect. Next, grab your largest suction cup and press it onto the thickest end of your large tentacles. You don't need adhesive. The latex will stick to itself good enough for this step. Then just work your way down the tentacle, adding smaller and smaller suction cups. And you don't have to go all the way to the end. When you're done, it should look something like this. Next, I paint a layer of latex over all of the suction cups and tentacle so it dries and locks them on permanently. Try not to completely fill in the suction cups with a puddle of latex. Once you have the entire thing coated in latex, just let it dry and then it should look like this. Only make one or two large tentacles with suction cups. Leave the small tentacles without them. Now it's time to add some paint. Any brown acrylic craft paint will do. I use a wet brush, dip it in the paint, and just wash down the entire tentacle with watery brown paint. Then immediately before the paint has time to dry, I grab a wet paper towel or rag and wipe most of the brown paint off the high points leaving the brown just in the deep spots so you get a good contrast. You can paint this in little sections at a time, that way the paint doesn't dry on you before you have time to wipe off the high points. Now do the same thing to all the other tentacles. Once the paint is dry, lightly coat all the tentacles with a crystal clear or satin finish to seal them a bit. All right, now you should have a bundle of squid parts. We made custom tanks for each of the guns but I'm just using an acrylic dome for this demo. Arrange the tentacles so that the large ones with the suction cups are visible and the smaller tentacles are intertwined with them. You can actually knot some together like this to make a tighter cluster in the middle. And you really can use as many or as few as you like. And this is pretty much what our finished little squid creatures looked like. And the last step was filling the tanks with yellow, green, or blue liquid made with water, caro syrup, and food coloring. And there you have it! That's how you make your very own Men in Black alien brain creature. It really was an awesome experience to have worked on such an amazing film. And with three sequels, new merchandise, and endearing fans, I think people are going to remember Men in Black for a long, long time. I know I will. No, you won't. <laughs>